the record button, we can. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think most of you know that I'm Douglas McLeod, uh, the chair of the Center for Architecture at Athabasca University. And one of the interesting things about Athabasca University is that we have um, we have staff and students in 84 countries around the world. And so many of us work and live on the traditional lands of indigenous people right around the globe. I myself live on the unceded territory of the Selix Nation, and we honor the ancestry, the heritage, and the gifts of all these peoples and nations. And I would encourage you to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat. But we also support the 94 recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I hope that we can act as allies in realizing recommendations such as the call to action number seven, which is we call on the federal government to de develop with Aboriginal groups a joint strategy to eliminate educational and employment gaps between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians. So this is particularly relevant to the, the lecture series today, which is of course focused on the future of architectural education. Um, and for a number of years, and I'd, I'd just like to say hello to all the people from around the globe who've joined us, maybe from our, our global studio. Uh, we hope to, in the near future, to renew that project, and we would invite everybody to be part of it. Uh, it did, that project actually demonstrated the, the breadth and the depth of architectural programs and approaches around the world. But the most valuable thing about it was the network of people it brought together to collaborate and, and share their work. And already, I'm seeing that this, this lecture series is also helping to build a new kind of network. And I tell you the truth, just touching base with some of the people who are going to be speaking has been a, just a really energizing experience. Um, I'm gonna introduce our speaker today in a moment, but just to give you an update, um, on Friday, this coming Friday, Neil Pender from, from London will talk about his initiatives to improve access to architecture and the creative industries for people from marginalized backgrounds. And then on Monday, Stacey Woolwich, um, she's got her, she's actually developed her own program called Make Your Own Masters. She found out how much a master's program cost in the United Kingdom, and she set up her own program. This is going to be a fascinating one, too. And then, and this is where we, we were talking about time zones. Um, on April the 2nd in North America, but April the 3rd in Australia, uh, Francesco Mancini, who is the deputy head of the School of Design and the Built Environment at Curtin, University in Perth is going to be speaking. This is a totally online uh, and very innovative school in Australia. I'm going to speak about what we do at Athabasca on April the 9th, and then we're going to close off with Phil Bernstein, who's the Associate Dean at Yale University. Um, he's going to talk about AI and, edu and the education of an architect um, on April 23rd. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pop into the chat a link to our Instagram account where you can find out more information about every lecture and you can register for them as well. But today, we are very fortunate to hear from um, Dr. Marc Nouveau, who is a professor of architecture and a founding co-director of the Center of Building Innovation at Arizona State University. And prior to his, his appointment, Mark, um, Mark was head of the architecture program at ASU, as well as the Chair and Associate Dean of Architecture at Woodbury University in Los Angeles. In both institutions, Mark has worked with faculty to rethink and develop curricula intended to improve student learning and outcomes. And during his first year of service at Woodbury, both programs were awarded an eight-year reaccreditation from NAB, which is the National um, Architectural Accreditation Board. And he also helped launch IPAL, and this is very interesting, IPAL, is the integrated path to architectural licensing. We don't have this in Canada, but what it is, is it's where as you study, you can be completing the other requirements for licensing so that when you graduate, you can become a licensed architect. And at ASU, the program has grown dramatically and aligned with the mission of ASU to be more inclusive and impactful. And I, I'm hoping Mark will talk about some of those things today. Now, along with Phil Horton, uh, uh, Mark is helping to launch the Center for Building Innovation at ASU. In that role, he's developing K-12 outreach to help diversify the pipeline of students entering into the disciplines of the built environment. And more specifically, he is working with Girls Can Build, a local nonprofit organization, and the Girl Scouts Arizona Cactus Pine Council to develop a patch program for the Girl Scouts. And through this initiative, 
He's working with the Herberger Young Scholars Academy and the ASU Preparatory Academy to raise awareness of careers in the built environment. He's also participating in a transdisciplinary research initiative with the Global Futures Lab Laboratory, the Bureau of Overseas Building Operations, um, Studio MA, and other units within ASU. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Mark. Thank you very much, Mark, for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the work you do, and thank you for inviting me. And Emma, thanks for all the work uh, you do behind the scenes. You've been really, really helpful. Um, so I really appreciate that introduction. Um, I'm. It's a you know, it's a sort of interesting thing to give one of these lectures because um, I don't really know the audience very well. It's online. People are in different time zones. So um, I'm just going to roll with it. If people have questions along the way, I'm happy to try to answer them in the chat. Um, I have about 60 slides or so. It shouldn't take too, too long. Um, but I'm going to try to talk about the future of architectural education and, and what that what that means uh, for us here today. Um, thank you for the introduction. I won't go over it again, um, but I am a professor of architecture at ASU and I'm a co-director of a Center of Building Innovation. I was also the, um, the editor of the Journal of Architectural Education for a number of years, uh, which I mentioned because... Um, it, it's really incredible to see how, or to, to get to know so many faculty, to really engage with their research. And it, it gave me a really broad view of architectural education, um, both in the US and Canada, but also uh, globally. So there's a story that I was once told, and I'm not sure if it's true, uh, so I'll put that out there. But uh, according to uh, either history or myth, um, NASA approached Lou Kahn in the in the 50s and said, would you design us what an airship or a space shuttle will look like in 50 years? And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. And they said, why, would, why won't you do that? And he said, because if I can draw it now, we can build it. And so when we're talking about the future of architectural education, um, I don't want to make a, a sort of pitch to what we can do in the future. What I'd like to do is show you what we're doing now, because I think the future in many ways is now. And so if we can draw this shiny spaceship Let's do it. So that's what we're going to talk about uh, today. So four topics. I'm going to talk about Arizona State University. I'm going to talk about architecture at ASU, uh, building innovation at ASU, and then some of what I see as obstacles and opportunities because they're they're co-joined uh, at the hip. So ASU. So I teach at Arizona State University. Uh, we're based, our main campus is in Tempe, Arizona. Uh, the Valley, as which it's known, uh, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Tempe uh, are all kind of mixed together. It's one big place. ASU is a massive university. It's an incredibly diverse university. And we are in a desert. So we have a very challenging environment uh, to live in. We have a long history here of people living in the Valley from the Hohokam uh, forward, Spanish missionaries, etc., and they've all built in ways that have had to respond to the environment. And we we continue to struggle with that, I would say, uh, as, we, as we move forward. In 2002, um, there was a new university president established at Arizona State. His name is Michael Crow. And with a number of people, uh, they established a new charter for the university. And the charter reads, ASU is a comprehensive public research university measured not by whom it excludes, but whom it includes and how they succeed, advancing research and discovery of public value and assuming fundamental responsibility for the economic, social, cultural, and overall health of the communities it serves. So this is a pretty radical uh, mission for a university. So if you think about uh, a school like Harvard or MIT, they are known because they are exclusive. They're known because they don't let 30,000 kids come to their campus every year. So ASU has challenged that and said, what happens when we, we become radically inclusive? What does that mean? What does it mean to do research that impacts our communities locally? What does it mean to not do research that just is white paper research, but is actually uh, impactful research? Um, how can a university be uh, an economic uh, stabilizing force, right? And he's looked at places like San Diego, uh, places like Pittsburgh, Seattle, Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, all those places have very strong research universities that have stabilized the economy in many ways. And so after the 2007 uh, recession that hit Arizona, um, Maricopa County was where we sit, was one of the worst hit 
counties in the United States, um, there was a, a kind of a call to sort of be a stabilizing force. And so radical inclusion, impact locally, this is really the sort of mantra of ASU. And he's outlined this in a number of books, uh, the Designing the New American University, and then another book called The Fifth Wave University, which I'll talk about in a moment. But ASU, just to give a kind of baseline, is a very different type of university than any university that, uh, that I've been a part of uh, or that I know of in the, in the US. And to give you a sense of what this means, um, there are three state universities uh, in Arizona. Arizona State, University of Arizona, and um, Northern uh, Arizona University. U of A and ASU are the sort of longest standing ones. And our graduate, our student population uh, last year was about 135,000 students. Uh, U of A had almost 50, so we're more than double. First year retention rate, which is a massive number, it's a really important um, gauge for success for students was about the same. We were a little bit higher, but about 85, 86%. We only have though about 2000 more faculty and staff and we have less than half of the buildings. So we're doing more with less. And this is a big, big thing for Michael Crow. So trying to understand how a university can work at scale and being radically inclusive has been the mission uh, of ASU for many years. Michael Crow also talks about the university as a fifth wave university. And what that means is that it's a, it's a different type of university in conception. So if universities began uh, with a kind of Greek model, if you think about Harvard College, et cetera, as sort of a Greek model of an academy, the second wave was a state school. So a, a university supported by a specific state, for example, University of Georgia, North Carolina. The third wave, uh, in the mid 19th century during the civil war in the United States was uh, were land grant colleges. So those were colleges that had a, um, uh, they were the result of the Morrill Act, but they had a, a sort of call to be in a sense, sort of local. After that research universities emerge and those universities, I would say the budget model is really based upon research, but the faculty are brought in to do research um, in addition to teaching, but research is really the primary focus. And the fifth wave, what Michael Crow calls the fifth wave, are really national service universities. And those universities um, are really about combining uh, a scale, so scaling up. They're inclusive of research, but they're also um, very much embedded in their community. So this is a, a different type of university sort of altogether. And the composition of our, of our university um, sort of demonstrates that sort of difference. So at the core of our university is the knowledge core, all the ideas, the research, the teaching, the sort of the the, the knowledge that's at the base of everything uh, is really the, the sort of basis of ASU. That then goes into a number of different enterprises. And so the academic enterprise is what is the teaching, the, the students who matriculate to a degree that's understood as the academic enterprise. The knowledge enterprise is research. And again, that's research for the common, for the for public good, for action. The learning enterprise is what happens before and after. So lifelong learning, what happens K through 12? What happens after you graduate? How do we support learners in their entire life? Not just simply when they're matriculating towards a degree, but what happens after uh, after they graduate and what happens before. So learning enterprise is sort of on the opposite, other, either side of the, of the academic enterprise. And then there's the partnership enterprise, and that's really leveraging partnerships with companies, par leveraging partnerships with other universities, but getting outside of our walls, right? Like working with other people to try to try to build on all of these, uh, all these things. So ASU is a very different place. Uh, it's about radical inclusion. It's about teaching to scale. Architecture programs, however, across the United States, across Canada, are most often not teaching to scale. They are most often exclusive. Many, many schools have milestones where you have to pass a, a certain a bar to get into an architecture program. And at ASU, we had that as well. We we're a um, I'll sort of describe how we how we sit and then sort of what we've done to sort of change some things. So this is where we are. Um, this is these are our buildings. Uh, we have um, we're in a design school and I'll talk about that in a moment. Our facilities on the left design south in the middle is the bridge uh, and then design north to the right. 
we sit within a college called the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts. Uh, there's a film school, an art school, music, dance, theater, design, arts, media, and uh, engineering, FEDEM, which is a fashion school in Los Angeles, and we have a museum. So all of that uh, is our college. We have about um, 8,300 students, 1,500 or so of which are graduate students. In the design school, we have uh, five programs, architecture, landscape, uh, interior, industrial design, and visual communication design. So the design school is our unit, and then we sit within um, a college. Our program itself offers a non-professional undergraduate degree, a professional MARC, two-year degree, and then we have a one-year post-professional degree. So in the United States, to get licensure in most states, you need an accredited degree. In our case, that's our, our MARC. So the big question when I arrived in 2018, I was hired on to be the program head at ASU. The question was, how do we connect the, the mission, the charter of ASU, of the university, with an architecture program? An architecture program that had an intake of 200 to 300 students as first year students, and a milestone that would reduce that number to 45 students after the second year. I arrived in 2018 and the first uh, semester I was here, I had a meeting with our director who was given a letter by Michael Crow or sent by Michael Crow asking why a student with a 3.7 GPA wasn't accepted into the architecture program. And I said, I don't know, I didn't, I wasn't here, you know, I'm not sure what happened. Um, but he was pretty upset and he said, what is going on in architecture where you're denying students with a 3.7 GPA? And so that was a call to say, hey, what are we doing really? So after 2018, we started to rethink what the milestone meant. We started to roll it back by accepting more students each year. So we had to do a number, we had to rethink the program completely. And that's what I'll, I'll talk about now. So we phased out the milestone was the first thing. We rethought how studios could happen in the undergraduate program, which is a non-professional program. We redesigned them to have 100 person studios per faculty. So a 100 to one faculty to student ratio with a series of teaching, assign teaching assistants, which helps our graduate students because they can then get work. We also rethought how our admissions worked rather than having one date January 15, where everybody gets accepted, we started to do rolling admissions. So if you were, if your work was, was good, uh, we would accept you in September or October, whenever you applied. And that increased our graduate numbers because when students found out they were accepted, they would matriculate more quickly as opposed to getting a decision sometime in, in April and then deciding amongst five, amongst five or six schools. They knew immediately and they could, they could matriculate right away. We also, um, developed a new curriculum, which I'll talk about in a moment, which made the undergraduate program much more accessible. So if you're a transfer student, if you wanted to matriculate more quickly, if you want to do it more slowly, we made the program so it was not lockstep, so that you could actually sort of matriculate uh, more easily and more accessibly uh, through the program. So in 2017, 16, 17, we had about 400 students. Uh, by 2022-23, uh, we had over 1,100 students. So we grew the program pretty dra dramatically. This meant we had to rethink space, how space worked. Um, scheduling is really at the core of everything. It's amazing how you can have all these great ideas, and if you don't have the schedule figured out, it doesn't work. So we had to rethink the schedule to include hot desks, uh, rethink the timings of studios when they happened. It couldn't just be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but now studios are every day for different people. And this meant we had to be really, really intentional about studio culture. Like how do you actually make a culture when students aren't at their desks all the time? And, you know, most, even prior to COVID, students weren't at their desks all the time. So we had to rethink how that, how that happened. And we also had to take advantage of, of different modalities. And so Prior to COVID, uh, there was a like a real um, real sense that we couldn't teach studio online, and that you know studios online were sub subpar; they were not as good. Students had to be in person, and COVID really opened up a lot of eyes and opened up a lot of possibilities. And now 
we teach uh, in person, we teach hybrid, we teach asynchronous, synchronous. Uh, there's a number of different modalities of teaching. We've been able to take advantage of that. And the scale of our, of our growth has forced us to take advantage of that. And just to give you a sense, this chart shows enrollment in the design school. Uh, architecture is the blue line that's going up. The yellow line that you see very dramatically growing is the undergraduate visual communications program. And that growth is exclusively online. And so that just shows you the there's there's real need for this uh, for online education. We have grown somewhat, I think, sustainably. The VCD program has been it's they've been having challenges staffing how that program has been taught. So a little bit about how we changed the curriculum. What you're seeing here is the full six years of our program. So the first four years is undergraduate leads to a, a Bachelor of Science in Design in the last two years, our Masters of Architecture. What we've done is we've been able to uh, intake students for a three-year program. So if you don't have a degree in architecture, you can come in for a three-year program. And we've made the fourth year of our undergraduate really the first year of our graduate program. So we have three years of six credit studios, um, three years of very dedicated focused courses on technology, history theory, visualization, uh, pro practice, research, et cetera. The undergraduate program is really meant to be open. It's meant to be accessible. We want students from all across the campus to be taking classes in architecture. And we've dubbed this architecture of. So the word architecture is used in many contexts, architecture of film, the architecture of technology, the architecture of, of universities, et cetera. So we want to understand these classes as really open um, there, it's mostly based on general studies and electives. We want to get them out of the way so that students are better prepared to enter into the six unit studios in the graduate program. So in the undergraduate studios are three units. They're, they're really skill building, um, trying to sort of see the built environment in new ways, uh, but it's not meant to be a kind of professional program, but we want to kind of capture the idea that architecture, uh, crosses across many, many, many boundaries. The graduate program is dubbed Architecture Plus. And at ASU, we have an incredible amount of programs dedicated to the built environment. They happen to be in a whole host of other universe, other colleges, uh, but we have sustainability, we have uh, construction management, we have real estate, we have a lot of different programs that relate to the built environment, but our students aren't necessarily uh, with those students. So when they graduate, they'll be talking to people in construction, but that school is in another college. And so what we wanted to do was to rethink the curriculum, rethink the structure of the curriculum to have students have a studio and two classes and then be able to do something else. And so architecture plus something. So many of our students work. So if you have to work 20 hours a week, 30 hours a week, you can do that. It's possible. Our classes are scheduled on Mondays and Wednesdays. Studios are in the afternoons, the other classes are in the morning. So you have three days a week that you could actually do other things. You could take another credential, you could do, uh, you could work, you could be a parent, you could do a lot of different things. So we're trying to make this much more flexible uh, so that students can actually do more things. And so we, we've left space in their, um, in their schedules to do other things, to get a credential, et cetera. And this has been really interesting. We've had a number of students take degrees in architecture and construction management architecture and sustainability, architecture plus community solutions, architecture plus biomimicry. We have a, a degree program in biomimicry here. Uh, Paul got an MBA uh, and is now working in development. Uh, and Holly also got a degree in uh, real estate development and is now working actually in a construction office uh, doing architecture design and development. So in a construction management firm doing um, development and design. Namitha is uh, working uh, on campus planning. She has a dual degree in urban planning and architecture. And all of this was happening um, well, as I mentioned at the beginning about our location, the architecture program sits within the design school, which sits within the college, the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts. So we are the only program in North America that's not part, that does, does not have kind of leadership level at the school or college or the institute. And this is a, a diagram, a study done by the um, Association of the Collegiate Schools of Architecture here in the US, 
where they looked at where the leadership was in architecture programs. And there were three at this time, there were three schools like SciArc, Taliesin at the time in the new school where architecture was at the head of everything. The leadership was the university. Then the majority of programs have a college of architecture where the dean is, the, co the college of architecture has a dean. And then there's a number of programs or schools and ASU is the only one that's three levels deep. And I mention this because it affects um, financial, it affects the budget greatly because our, we don't have fiduciary responsibility at the, at the program level that's held at the school level. Um, we don't make decisions about um, a number of things. And so we're sort of, in a way, we're, we're sort of trying to make change, but working against uh, five other programs who might not want to make change as quickly. And so there's a lot of, there's has been a lot of sort of tension uh, internally with how these changes have happened. So uh, two years ago, um, I transitioned my role from program head uh, to launching a new uh, center. And the center doesn't try to operate within the program level um, structure. It's actually trying to rethink how we might structure and reposition the program of architecture across the entire university at ASU. And so as Bucky Fuller said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the old model uh, or the existing model obsolete. And that's what we're trying to do with Kobe. So building innovation, um, it's the center. So I'm now the co-director of what's known as the Center of Building Innovation. And the Center of Building Innovation has a, 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 a sort of clear commitment to address two of the greatest issues that we're all faced with today, the advancement of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and our responsibility to climate and ecology. So social justice and environmental justice, which are really intertwined. Like how might we actually address these issues at scale uh, and really with, with real solutions, not just a new building, which isn't really gonna help us. So the idea is to bring together all the disciplinary units within the built environment AS, at ASU into one center to collaborate across the enterprises, the knowledge enterprise, the academic enterprise, and the learning enterprise. And that's really what, what's at core here, what's at stake here is one, getting out of our silo, uh, getting out of the design school, working with all of the units around ASU that are, that, are, that are invested in the built environment and bringing people together, bringing students together, bringing faculty together, working on research together, and getting even outside of the um, the degree programs, really thinking about how we address K through 12 and how we address lifelong learning. So really um, abiding to the mission of ASU through the built environment. So what does that, what does that look like? So in the knowledge enterprise, we've partnered, uh, ASU has a massive partnership with Starbucks. Starbucks, of course, is ubiquitous uh, in the US and growing around the world, but they have an interest to think about how they might be more sustainable. And so we were involved in a program um, with other units around the university to think about how uh, their buildings might actually, their actual physical structures might in fact be more sustainable. So uh, we were involved with the Center for the Future, Global Futures, uh, to think about what does it, what does that look like moving forward? How can how can their their actual structures be more sustainable in the long term? We also worked with the um, the building of over or sorry the Bureau of Overseas Building Operations. So OBO is the as part of the State Department in the United States that oversees all of the buildings around the world that are owned by the U.S. not on U.S. soil. So everything on foreign soil, all the embassies. Everything that uh, is is owned by the U.S. It's a massive portfolio, and a couple of years ago they approached ASU, uh, and we were involved with a number of programs around the university. OBO looked at risk uh, in two ways: they looked at financial risk and they looked at um, political risk when determining how to build, where to build, and what to build. They never looked at at um, sustainable risk or environmental risk. And so we were brought on to do a study on how they might think about environmental risk in their building portfolio for the next 50 years. And it was really, really interesting. We worked with risk management people at ASU. We worked with Global Futures. Uh, it was really fascinating. And we developed a basically a, a chart, a kind of decision tree 
on how to deal with sustainability, sustainable risk and environmental risk in uh, 16 different contexts around the globe. Uh, currently, we're working on a, um, a, a climate futures exchange with a university in Palestine and the Jad National University, uh, which has been kind of incredible, as you can imagine, uh, since October 7th. We've been working with them uh, since the summer, looking at how we might understand building sustainably in two different parts of the world that are very similar from an environmental perspective, very different in some ways politically, but our students are working together uh, this semester in a studio to look at a, a kindergarten in, in Nablus. And the past semester we looked at, uh, we had a, a very large um, exchange, about 500 students were working together every week, uh, talking about architecture. And eventually in the coming year, this will be a virtual exchange where we'll be working on projects uh, through uh, VR together. Um, two different you know, people from Anadja in Palestine and students from ASU working on the same projects uh, virtually. In the academic enterprise, uh, so these are studios. So this is these are classes that we've run. Uh, these classes have have involved again people from all around the university. Uh, we do we tend to co-teach or group teach. We tend not to have one faculty to twenty students or so, but we bring in a lot of different people. This studio looked at um, the role of of um, of affordable housing in three different contexts: in Mexico, in Los Angeles, and in Phoenix. And it brought in real estate developers, contract uh, construction management folks, uh, politicians as well, to try to think about how architects might get ahead of um, the RFP process. So how we might be involved more uh, sooner, really, in the process. And we looked at different uh, strategies and proposals that were being successful in Los Angeles, in Phoenix, and in Mexico to try to adjust or to try to affect some change uh, here in Phoenix. We have a, a real need for affordable housing. Uh, along with the embassy project, the research project, we ran a studio where students actually helped with the research. So they were engaged in the research, looking at the 16 different contexts, 16 different cities around the globe and developing uh, not only a decision tree, but also some um, some actual proposals for design to, to sort of mitigate uh, risk and to, to make building more resilient. We're also running a studio. Uh, this is an ongoing studio. It started last year. It's going to, um, we'll have another one this spring where we've partnered with a group called Brick by Brick uh, locally who makes compressed earth block. So it's a stabilized earth in construction, which is very smart here in the Valley. We have a, a history of Adobe construction and earth construction, but stabilized brick, uh, stabilized block, excuse me, has a bit of Portland in it. it. So it doesn't actually crumble in water. It doesn't have to be finished. It's made locally. It's very, very sustainable. And our first project uh, was with a church in Mesa. Uh, Mesa is a, a neighboring uh, city to Tempe and to Phoenix. And the church, uh, the Iglesia Cristiana del Buen Pastor, is a, a church that um, accepts about 40 asylum seekers every week. So ICE, which is the immigration um, uh, immigration group uh, from the government here in the United States, they drop off 40 asylees. So people who are at the border, they're bussed up into Phoenix from the Mexico border and they're dropped off at this church. Pastor Hector uh, then um, gives them directions to get to either the train, the bus or plane to go to their final destination in the US. However, they're not always able to make the connections. And so over the past eight years or so, they have slept in the church or in the classroom on the, on the church property. So we partnered with Pastor Hector and the, the church to develop a, a shelter program. So we have a, a studio that, that was uh, working to design a shelter for the church. Uh, we reached out to the University of Washington. I have a close friend who's an expert in earth and construction, uh, Elizabeth Golden. And so working with the University of Washington, with Brick by Brick, with the church here in Mesa, with some folks in construction here at ASU, uh, we've developed a studio to to design this uh, this shelter. Uh, after the sh after the studio ended, Pastor Hector, who was involved in the process, said, "So which one can we build?" And we said, "Well, this was just an academic an an exercise." And he said, "No, let's let's build one." So over the summer, Elizabeth and I redrew the project. Uh, we've started to uh, go through the process of rezoning, and we're currently trying to fundraise for the project. So that's a super interesting 
it has been a really amazing experience, uh, a project that began as an academic uh, studio, which will now become uh, a building, hopefully in the next year or so. Uh, we've also been involved uh, with the Girl Scouts, and I'm a founder of a group called Girls Can Build. It's a local nonprofit where we're trying to encourage more women to get into uh, the built environment, the, the, the disciplines of the built environment. The first project was a patch program. Uh, we raised about $250,000 to make a mobile building space, which is essentially a, a cargo, a box truck that can roll up into various sites around Arizona and deploy project-based badge programs that are uh, supporting the built environment, get, get young women interested in becoming a contractor or a plumber or an electrician or an architect. Um, and that program uh, kicked off in the fall. It's going to launch uh, fully this summer. And then this year, we're working on a mentorship program called Build Her, uh, where we're pairing or partnering uh, women in the built environment uh, who are a bit further on in their career with um, either recent graduates or college students to help them sort of navigate uh, careers in the built environment. And that's everything from construction, real estate, management, architecture, et cetera. Uh, in the learning enterprise, uh, we've been working um, with ASU Prep, which is a high school, a local high school, and we've established a micro school in at our college. So every Monday and Wednesday, students are are enrolled in a class that I teach, a first year class that I teach, and then on on Fridays, we work together to do a studio based project. The first project was a school; they designed a, a elementary school. Uh, the second project was to to sort of solve a problem in the built environment in their neighborhood. And this year, they're redesigning uh, uh, the building that they're in on campus. And so, again, this is about getting students who might not think most of these students would probably not go to college. Getting enrolled in ASU Prep is a is really to prepare them to go to college. Having them be on campus sort of opens their eyes to say, "Wow, I could actually be here on campus. It's not that much of a of a of a lift." And then having them be involved in the in a project that's about the built environment opens them up to the potential of a career in the built environment. And again, in that class, in that studio, we bring in people from real estate. We bring in people from construction, from sustainability. We give tours about around the campus, et cetera. So those are some things that are in the works. Uh, we have a number of projects in the future that haven't launched yet, um, one of which is a leadership program that we're hoping to sort of bring together people around the valley. Um, again, I'll real estate, construction, architecture, to talk about how, you know, how we could actually help people sort of mid-career move into leadership roles. And that's sort of in, in the future, but that's, uh, we haven't launched it yet. So I'm not going to, not yet ready to talk about it. So I'll end with some, some of what I'll call op obstacles and uh, opportunities. And these are may maybe some kind of observations of what's happened in the past five years at ASU and some of the things we've encountered um, sort of moving forward. Uh, one of them is is modalities. And I have had the fortune of, I, I work at ASU and they have, we have a lot of resources for how to teach online. So I didn't go to school to learn how to be a teacher. I have a PhD in architecture, so I know how to do research in a very specific way. When I came to ASU, uh, there was a number of different uh, opportunities that sort of supported teaching. They like there were classes on how to teach. So I, I took a number of these classes on how to teach and how to teach specifically online. There is still this bizarre kind of, um, I don't know, opinion that somehow online teaching is less or other. And one of the things we're trying to get around here at ASU is that it's just a different modality. And our our online MARC is the exact same as our on the ground MARC. Same faculty teach in both, the curriculum's the same, it's just a different modality. And you get a diploma from ASU, there's no difference, there's no asterisks, there's no like, you know, different color, the diploma is the exact same. And I think that if more schools were able to do this, I, and I, I'm hoping, I mean, the silver lining of the, of the pandemic, hopefully, is that we can do it, it's possible, it's not, and you're doing it. So if we could get more people to do this, I think modality is going to be a massive, it's a, it's an opening for access that I think more universities need to embrace in some way. And, and Michael Crow talks about super faculty 
who teach across five modalities. And I'm somebody who can teach across all five modalities. And so I think it's really important that we really embrace the different ways in which people learn, the different ways in which people can go through and matriculate uh, into higher education. The second obstacle and opportunity is culture. And this is an image of the uh, University of Michigan, which has a, an incredible studio space. That's history. That may exist for some people, but I think the, the idea of creating culture online is incredibly important and different than when I was in school, for sure, right? There was this kind of red badge of courage that you had to stay up all night, pull all-nighters, like, you know, just really unhealthy activity. And that just isn't, this, that's not where we're at. And I think it's totally unhealthy. And our students are not all the same, right? I went to school and there were 45 students in my program. We were all around the same age. We were all roughly around the same, we had roughly the same background. We were very, very similar. Our students are all different. They're coming from all parts of the world. So how do we be much more intentional about making culture happen, making studio culture, but also the culture of the school? I think it's a huge opportunity to uh, challenge and change the way we think about architectural education in a space that has multiple modalities. And I, I, I think another challenge and opportunity is to get outside of our five-year degree or our three-year degrees. Like, how do we change what we do? How do we sort of expand the knowledge core of what we do to include students K through 12 or to include students who are lifelong learners? There's a program here at ASU. There's a, a housing tower that was just built right to the west of where I'm sitting. It's called Mirabella. And if you lease a unit at Mirabella or if you buy a unit at Mirabella um, and there's 300 available, uh, you can take any class you want at ASU. And I teach a large first year class called the Architecture of Architecture, uh, first semester, second semester, two, two classes. And I have every semester a handful of 65, 70, 80 year old folks sitting in the class taking it. And I, I just think this is an amazing opportunity. We could. We have a knowledge core and why not expand that into spaces that are not just about matriculating students, not just degree seeking students. So how do we think about architecture programs to expand uh, into that space? And really for me, it's an issue of access. It's not just an issue of sort of more people in seats. It's, it's giving more access to people who might not have access to higher education or who didn't have access to higher education. Like how can we actually support uh, those students, not only in school when they're 18 years old, but prior to that and also uh, through their entire lives. Leadership is key in all this from my perspective. Uh, Michael Crow is an incredible leader. I've drunk the Kool-Aid as you probably understand, uh, can um, understand or hear from my voice, but Michael Crow has been an amazing leader. He's also been very stable. I think one of the problems and one of the obstacles is instability in leadership. We've had a lot of change in leadership in our program, in our school, and that causes a lot of instability and it makes things really challenging. So I think having leaders in higher education who are willing to toe the line, who are willing to sort of have a vision and really sort of stick around to see it out is, is really quite, quite important. The discipline and the profession. Um, there has been a lot of conversation recently, and I'm not sure how much of it has kind of expanded into Canada or around the world, but um, recently the um, NAAB, which is National Architectural Accreditation Board in the US, had proposed a changed model for funding. So the typical model, it, right, or the model that's been in place for 75 years or so, has been that the accreditation board is comprised of academics and professionals, right? So there's a, a group of people on uh, the accreditation board that are from coming from academia, coming from professional practice, and that the funding model was that the AIA, the American Institute of Architects, the NCARB, which is the Board of Registration, uh, state registration boards across the US, and ACSA, which represents all the schools, all three of those bodies would contribute to the funding of NAB. And then the AIAS the student body would add a little bit as well. That funding model was challenged. 
and there was a move for NAB to to basically to get funding directly from schools, which means that ACSA could no longer negotiate funding. There are a lot of it was causing a lot of a lot of um, tension, I should say. Within all of that, there's a kind of backstory of NCARB proposing a four-year professional degree, which on one hand, everybody's upset about because I went through a five-year degree or I went to graduate school. No way can we do this in four years. How do we get everything done in four years? And is this just a, a money grab? Like there's a lot of questions about that. There's also a conversation about getting a path to licensure without an accredited degree. And Arizona is one of the states that you do not need an accredited degree to get a license. You need to go to work under an architect for about 10 years, but you can be licensed without an accredited degree. So of course, many schools are upset about this because then what is the value of an accredited degree? So the relationship between the kind of profession of architecture, the idea that one matriculates through school, goes on to become a licensed architect, is getting cleaved off in some ways from the from the sort of discipline of architecture, the ideas of architecture, the history and theory. Like there's a there's a moment right now, I think we're, we're in a really uh, tense moment. And if we wanna follow the money, uh, if we look at the sort of three things that are needed for a licensure in the United States, one is education, the second is experience, and the third is the exams, NCARB owns two of those things. And so I think that there's going to be a shift in the next 5, 10, 15 years. And on one hand, you know, the sort of part of me is worried that, gosh, how do you get a four-year de four year degree and go be a licensed architect? Or how do you not even have to get a degree to be a licensed architect? On the other hand, college is really expensive. And why have why does architecture have five-year degrees, right? Why not just have a four-year degree? And is that, would that make architecture more accessible? Maybe, you know, so I'm, I'm, really on the fence on this, but I think it's going to be a, a major issue in the next uh, few years. So it'll be very interesting to see uh, how that how that sort of sorts itself out. And of course, looming behind all of this uh, is AI. I um, We can't sort of talk about the future without it. Um, and I want to read this bit really quickly. It says, the future of architectural education envisions a dynamic shift towards interdisciplinary collaboration, sustainability, and technology integration. Emerging tools like virtual reality and artificial intelligence will redefine design exploration, allowing students to experience and manipulate spaces in immersive environments. Sustainability will become a core focus, emphasizing eco-friendly practices and resilient design solutions. Architectural education will foster greater collaboration with other fields, promoting a holistic approach to problem solving. Additionally, the curriculum will adapt to address social and cultural considerations, preparing architects to engage with diverse communities. As the profession evolves, architectural education will emphasize adaptability, creativity, and a deep understanding of the societal impact of design decisions. I think that sounds great. I'm all for it. And I should tell you um, that uh, yesterday I typed into chat GPT, what is the future of architectural education in 100 words? And that's what was generated by AI. So again, I'm really on the fence. I'm completely afraid of what the future <laughs> means with AI. On the other hand, I am fascinated by the possibilities. And I'm, I run a seminar this semester and the students are actually using generative AI to translate architectural projects. And it's been incredible to see what happens. And so, you know, I think it's a huge topic for conversation. I'm sort of excited to see where it is, uh, but I don't think it's going away. So I think we definitely need to deal with it. And I will end with that. So again, thank you so much. I'm happy to sort of uh, take questions or to open up a conversation, however uh, this, this could work. And maybe I'll Wonderful. stop sharing. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you very much. The um... That was just wonderful. It was uh, it resonated with so many of the issues that we've been talking about. Um, but we do have a number of comments and questions, so I'll get I'll get right into them. Um, Great. Um, actually, there's two comments from uh, from Nushan. Um, she first of all, she mentioned architecture of what a great idea, and I have to sort of echo that as well. And then she also said, "Thank you for the presentation, Mark. Very refreshing and interesting. Very impressive work. It sounds like a well thought out program." A couple of summers ago, I met Rick Joy and a couple of other people from your university, and there was talk about how your university also focuses on architecture students' mental health, 
Would you please talk about that as well? That is a great, great, great question. I, you know, I, gosh, I started teaching in 1997. Um, I went back, to, uh, my PhD is from 2004, and I've been full-time teaching since that time. So I'm getting older. And uh, I, I have to say, like, after COVID, um, uh, like issues around mental health issues around neurodiversity as well, um, have really, really come to the forefront. And I, ha I have to say it's, 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 it's great to see. I mean, it's really important. Our, our university, um, mandates that we do training every year. So one of the trainings I have to do is in, uh, fire prevention. So I have to know how to, uh, do a, a, a fire hose or whatever it's called, like a fire extinguisher, knowing how those work. Uh, but we also have uh, counseling uh, services. And one of the points they make is that faculty are not psychologists, faculty are not counselors. So don't try to manage it yourself. We have an incredible system of uh, support for students, all free. So anybody can walk in any time of day. Uh, if there's a crisis, uh, we have numbers to call where people can get immediate help. Um, but we have, as a faculty, really talked about this because we're seeing it more and more. And it's you, it's just, it's here, it's not going to go away. And so as a university, ASU has been fantastic at helping to support our students. And I should also say our faculty, because it's it's been difficult uh, on faculty as well. Um, but the university has an incredible support system for students' mental health. And so we have, you know, our job is basically to 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 offer or to show them what the uh what the opportunities are for support but it's been a we have been talking about it because it's it's a huge issue uh currently uh for us thank you thank you Nushin, for that um and selma has written in in the chat thank you for an amazing lecture i am a newcomer to canada studied architecture in sudan and one year postgraduate program in the united kingdom is there a book about creating studio culture or online culture? You, you may be able to be better to uh, answer that than I am. I don't know of one. Um, one of the things we've been trying to do is to try to think about the program as one program with different modalities. And that means that every time an announcement goes out about a lecture or an event, there's a an a way to make sure that the students who are online can be included. Um, there are, we're, we've created this uh, sort of hangout space uh, where students, uh, we have a, at ASU, when, if you have an online program, you cannot mandate anything as synchronous. So part of the program is that it has to be asynchronous uh, because we can't sort of manage time zones. Uh, so we've had uh, asynchronous, or sorry, synchronous hangouts that are not mandated, but just trying to get people to to know each other, to meet each other. Uh, we've talked about having um, one week a year where the studio comes together in a particular place. We're not sure to do that. I and mean, we've sort of batted that around. One is to increase studio culture, but the second is like, if a student is taking an online degree, are they doing it because they can't move to Tempe for three years? Are they doing it because they have a life or a family that they, they need to be somewhere? So. We haven't done that yet, but that's been one idea that we've kicked around. But I, I don't know um, of, of any books that outline how to develop studio culture online. I would I would say, Selma, that we're kind of writing the book right now in our, our various institutions. And one of the reasons why this lecture series is, is so important is to see how other people are creating kind of online cultures. Um, what ASU is doing is, is very exciting, what Curtin is doing. Um, with, there were some experiments in South Africa as well, and so we're trying to learn from them all. But uh, this is why it's so great to hear you talk today, Mark, because you you guys are doing things that we hadn't even thought of yet, and uh, it's it's kind of exciting to hear that. Um, just so everybody knows, because uh, it, it, there are other um, there there's other lectures coming up. I just put the Instagram our Instagram account into the chat. And you can go there and you can register um, for all the upcoming lectures now. So this this is good. I'm just looking to see. Um, oh, uh, and, and Laura has put something um, uh, into the into the Q and A, um, and she she writes as a casualty of the architecture education system and a queer woman with disabilities. 
I have shifted to design anthropology to study the relationship between humans and their material environment. Where in design education do you see a human ecological lens being cultivated? And what are exercises of reflexivity and positionality to understand the role of a designer in social justice? Ooh, that's a big one. Um, I will try to um, respond. That's a really, that's a very big loaded question. And maybe I can reflect a little bit about my experience in architecture school. Uh, when I went to school, I, I graduated in 1995. I went to a small technical school in Boston called Wentworth. And all we did was talk to architects. And then I graduated and I went to work in an office and there were 65 architects who worked in the office. And I didn't talk to anybody else. I didn't, we didn't talk to the, the developer, the contractors, like nobody in the built environment other than architects. Uh, that's, that's what my world was that, right? And so then I went to get a graduate degree and I started looking at history theory, started teaching. And um, it was really, um, I think being teaching in Woodbury in Los Angeles, where like a degree was a, a path out. Like I, it was the first time in my life that I really recognized like how much a degree mattered and how expensive it was and how much it, it meant like an opportunity that like was just, it was, it was massive for the students. And coming to ASU, um, it, it's a totally different university. And I think that the problem with architecture schools in general is that we want to teach the way we were taught in some cases, right? People have this memory of their their own education and, and that they weren't trained to teach. They're they're trained as an architect. And so they come back to teaching and they work as, as they, they teach as they were taught. And I think that the ASU has offered, um, ASU is so big and has so many um, different types of people working on different types of things that I'm constantly amazed that like, we're not talking to them. And so like part of the reason of Kobe, the center of building innovation is to get outside of our, our, our silo and to actually think about, all right, there is somebody right now doing research on heat resiliency in, you know, in the urban environment and the relationship to, to, to sort of, uh, economics, right? There's somebody who's doing re that research right now at ASU that's the built environment. That's what I do, right? That's what I think I did. And so why are we not connected? And so your question is really interesting because it's about the built environment from a particular lens. And I think our students need to be exposed to that. And we need to, because that's their experience, right? Like not everybody has my experience. And so part of the, the, the idea of Kobe is in response to what I think was a really good education on one hand, but also a really limited education. And so that's, that's the real, that's really the idea behind Kobe. And it's not just construction, but we're also looking at, we have this really cool uh, college here called the College of Global Futures, which means nothing, right? It's just like, they just, it's bringing all these super interesting people together to think about how, what is the future of security? What's the future of technology? What's the future of, of all sorts of things? And so a lot of folks in that, in that school are thinking about the built environment in really interesting ways. And so Kobe is trying to sort of reach out across the university and get our students talking to those people. And I don't know if that answered your question because it was a loaded one. <laughs> so thank you. And um, we've got a, a question from uh, Leon and uh, Leon is from uh, Tishwani University of Technology, uh, which is in uh, Pretoria, South Africa. I had the, the pleasure of meeting with uh, Amir Osman from Tuts, um, both I and uh, Kristen Kornienko had dinner with her in, in Johannesburg, and uh, they're doing some fascinating work there. But but Leon says is is reflecting on the similarities um, for Tushwani's University of Technology Department of Architecture and Industrial Design, and he notes that he will show this recording when it is available to his HOD, which I think is head of department. Uh, but he asks the question: So the studio space is more online, but with a hot desk system for the undergrads. Yeah, so sorry, I, I'm sure my talk had a bunch of lingo in it, so I apologize for that. So the the historical um, sort of back to the bazaar model of studio education is that you have a desk that's yours that you sit at all the time. It's dedicated for the whole year. And we just don't have the space for that. Uh, we cannot accommodate growth and the number, we can't sort of align with the mission of the university because our buildings were built at a time 
1971 and 1995, where the program was capped. So there was a limited number of students in this program. And that was by nature, by design. So if we want to um, align with the mission, we need to change the way we teach. And so uh, we went from um, hot desks, which means that no one owns the desk during the whole year, but you're in the desk during your studio space. And then you work either at home or if you're in studio, you can work at a desk if someone's not on it. That's a hot desk. Uh, a cold desk is your desk for the whole time. So we started with undergraduate hot desks and now we've moved to hot desks for the whole program. And that that is that's allowed us for, to uh, accommodate the students we have, which is good. Students online um, do not have space on campus. They are working uh, in their in their homes where that, wherever they are. Um, sometimes they're actually working. Uh, we have a mix of our online population. The demographic is typically aging a little uh, older and typically um, thinking about a career change. So the online students are much more professionally focused. They're typically folks who are wanting to make a career change. Our on-ground graduate students are typically um, more of a mix and trend a little bit younger. But the desk space, the space situation and the schedule are key to everything. I want to say this again, like if you can figure out your schedule and I'll, I'll tell a quick anecdote, our um, our former director was was complaining to our dean that we need more space. He said, if you want us to grow, we need more space. So he showed up in our studios on a Tuesday morning and there was nobody in the building because architecture schools always have studios on Monday, Wednesday, Friday afternoons, right? This is always when we do it. This is when I did it. This is when like, everybody does it, right? So he came back on a Thursday afternoon. Nobody was on camp. Nobody was in the school. And he came back on a Wednesday morning because he heard studios were on Wednesdays. So he came back on a Wednesday morning and nobody was here. And so he said, I am not going to even like listen to you talk about the need for space until you fill that building. And so we've had to change our studios, our, our schedule. And it's it's good because we've been able to grow, but the schedule was was what needed to change. And again, that's a kind of mindset. Like we don't have to teach the way we were taught. We can teach differently and we need to. So. And, and um, I had a previous conversation with Mark a few months ago and he talked about re-spatializing education and things like not just hot desks, but also the mobile building space seemed to me to be really interesting instances of what we, we could be doing. Um, the University of, of Manitoba also has a mobile uh, design. Uh, it's kind of like a mobile building unit that goes out and helps people in different communities to build homes. And these are the kinds of things that we might wanna be thinking about how we could, not just doing things virtually online, but doing things differently in the real world as well. Um, and Mercedes has written, thank you for the informative presentation. I am excited to start classes this fall. I love the idea of architects going more involved in the earlier stages of the proposal building. I was wondering if there are areas of the program that will touch on how to work with, build and sustain relationships with indigenous communities. Architects and engineers are important resources for in indigenous communities to utilize to build a request for proposal projects for federal funding. Yeah, that's a that's an issue that's very much um, present uh, around us. I mean, we we have if you sort of uh, drive east, um, gosh, four miles from here, you're on a reservation. If you drive south, ten miles, twenty miles, you're on a reservation. So it's very much local. Our students, we have indigenous students. It's also very complex, and very complicated, um, and. For me to walk into a, a, a community um, is not simple, right? Like I just can't walk in and say, okay, I'm here to solve everything. That's exactly not what we want to do. Um, and there are real issues um, in the reservation. We have uh, a number of faculty, Wanda Dalla Costa, one of them, um, Tammy Eaglebull, another one, uh, who are um, very much engaged locally. And so we've been partnering um, one of our faculty, Claudio Vechstein, has been partnering uh, with uh, Wanda on projects. And so it's it's interesting. She has a, there's a, a great phrase that she uses. Um, there's a, a movement towards uh, placemaking. Uh, here on in ASU, there's a placemaking group. And Wanda has a phrase uh, called uh, placekeeping. So she doesn't want to make place. She wants to keep place. 
and she's I've been in workshops with her and if you, if you know her you, she's amazing she's an incredible uh leader and she's really uh great at kind of bringing together a community and trying to work with them on a project and so we've been working uh through Wanda and through Tammy Eagle Bowl uh to kind of make connections locally but it's it's a very complex thing because I I'm very I recognize the kind of um, optics in having a big university kind of come, come on over and sort of say, we're going to solve things. And I think just personally working with the church that we're working with, uh, with Pastor Hector, it's a, a Latinx church. Nobody speaks English um, and he's doing this incredible work. But again, we're not trying to like walk in and solve the problem. We're trying to partner with people to help everybody sort of rise up. And the, the project that he's doing is just it's it's really kind of incredible um and it's very tense right i mean I, I don't know if everyone's aware of the politics but arizona is a very conflicted state in many ways because we have a very strong re republican uh sort of anti-immigration population but we also have a demographic of a lot of immigrants and so there's this very complicated and we have an indigenous population there's a very complicated sort of demographic here in arizona and so we want to try to sort of like help work with people, but again, being respectful and and careful in how we do that. And Mercedes, I would share with you as well that um, I mentioned the University of Manitoba. Uh, Shauna Mallory Hill is doing some uh, really interesting work where the students are helping indigenous communities to collaborate on building homes. Also, um, Sylvie McAdam from the University of Windsor uh, has got a project uh, called One House, Many Nations, where she's actually uh, building uh, houses, tiny homes on reserves. Uh, one of the interest, well, one of the complications is, uh, is that it's very difficult to get some of the building trades into, um, uh, into reserves because they tend to be in remote parts of, of the land. So that's, that's one of the challenges. But the other one is, and I think you've hit it on the head, building the quest for proposals. So many federal programs need to, you have to be what's called shovel ready. And sometimes that's just beyond the capabilities of any community. So one of the things we're looking at is, could we put together a handbook for making shovel ready projects? And that, that might be of interest to you as well. Um, I'm gonna go back because Nusham had another uh, comment and question. And she said, may I ask, how did you utilize and uh, how you utilized and used your PhD in the current role you are involved in? I see you studied with Alberto Perez Gomez, a phenomenologist. I'd like to know what suggestions do you have for those pursuing PhDs and hoping to get involved in academia and make a positive impact in their program at the at their university? Uh, so that's also kind of complicated. Um, I. Uh, um, I often say that my doing a PhD was the most luxurious thing I've ever done in my life. And the reason I say that is that I, I was living in Montreal. I was single. I was, um, I had a Fulbright to study in Venice, you know, like who gets that? It's crazy. And so I was spending my days walking around Venice, studying in the Marciana library, drinking espresso, in the cafe next to it. Um, I would go have a spritz with my friends every night. I, it was amazing. It was incredible, right? And so far removed from reality. So I, you know, left that program. I graduated. I did my PhD in five years, so pretty quickly. And I got a job. Uh, I applied to a ton of schools. I got one, two interviews. I got one job at University of Manitoba and realized, like, I don't know how to teach. So my first year, I had to teach a class on the history of Canadian architecture. I was the only faculty member that was not Canadian. And it happened to be that the person who was teaching the history of Canadian architecture died that summer. And I got his office and his classes. And so I was like totally not ready to teach. And I fumbled through it and all my students were Canadian. They were expecting like some person who knew something, I knew nothing. So I had an incredible experience in Montreal, very, very wonderful experience. But I think the, um, you know, it's been 20 years now, looking back on it, I, I just think that it's a different world. It was a bubble that I was living in. I mean, Alberto accepted 10 students a year. We had 
two students, two PhD students every year. It was luxurious. It was amazing. I, we had this incredible rare book library that I really, really enjoyed. We had the Canadian Center for Architecture with Felix Lambert is like, you know, and just amazing, right? So I studied, my summers were spent at the Canadian Center for Architecture. And so I, I think that like my intellectual sort of shift or my intellectual positioning as a phenomenologist, I'm interested in narrative, like that continues my teaching. But I think the project of higher education is a much more important and interesting project. Like, how do we actually like, how do we change universities? And I, I'm very lucky to teach at ASU because I think we have a leader who wants to do that. Um, as I said, I taught at Woodbury University, which had a great mission, but financially was not super stable. And I was nervous it was going to close. Coming to a place like this, where you have like this vision from the president, and you can always say, listen, like we're doing this because it's the right thing to do and it's good. It's that for me is really exciting and important, but totally removed from my experience at McGill um, in ways that, you know, I, I I think we need to sort of access to higher education is one of the most important issues. And it the oh, there's all this research about the idea of a, a higher a, a college degree, the relationship between a college degree and social mobility uh, is massive. It's the biggest impact on social mobility we have. And so if we can have more students go to university, our our country will be better, you know? And, and I think the politics that are happening right now relate to that. There's, it's, it's a big, it's all, it's all connected, but, and that was a long way to, to sort of explain that my experience at, at McGill was wonderful, but not my experience of university now. Okay. Um, Hermie has a, uh, a question. Have you done any research about the reasons students choose the online option? So it's mostly anecdotal. And um, I, I've told this story a few times, but uh, I used to be the, like, the main admissions person for the graduate program. And what that means is I would read all of the essays and look at the portfolios and basically score them. And so we had a committee that did it, but I did it for both three year and two year. And I did it for online. And the online essays would, every, would inevitably bring me to tears because there was always a story of the mother of three who went to architecture school but had to drop out or the, you know, the person who um, was told by their parents that they couldn't be an architect. They had to go, go, do, go be a teacher or something like that. And so we don't have data, hard data, but the majority of the students choosing the online degree are older and changing directions in their career. And oftentimes it's a second career. Um, we had a student who is, uh, he was a, a, a lawyer who is tired of being a lawyer and wanted to build his own house and wanted to figure out how to do that and wanted to get a degree. He had enough money, he didn't need it, like didn't need to make a practice, but he wanted to do that. So um, it's really, um, again, we don't have hard data, but it's, it's really mostly students wanting to kind of change their, their career path. And I have to say, like, incredibly inspirational. Like, it was really, it's amazing. Like, I can't imagine being, you know, 45 years old and having your family and, you know, then all of a sudden saying, you know what, I'm going to go back to school. Like, that's tough. It's not not an easy thing. So. It, it's absolutely true. Again, it's, it's only anecdotal. But um, when we used to have a convocation ceremony up in Athabasca and um, uh, people were allowed to read out a a one minute statement about their personal journey towards their degree. And if you could keep from tearing up um, after you've heard, heard these stories, uh, you must have a heart of stone because of some yeah. of the, you know, the incredible things that people do to get an education. And you, you realize that there is a whole, just a whole strata of society um, for whom going full-time to a bricks and mortar school is just not in the realm of possibility. Right. And there's all sorts of reasons for it. But Hermie, I think you ask a very important question. Um, we should get some hard, cold data on that. And uh, because I think we'd find some very interesting things about it. Um, uh, also really, really quickly, like, I know Athabasca partners with um, like different programs. Uh, like there's a, a partnership with, I think it's a, there's a hockey league in the West. Um, so ASU has also, we partnered with Starbucks. So if you work at Starbucks, you can get a degree at ASU. We partnered with the um, the armed forces. So there's all these great pathways. 
for degrees while you're in the military. Michael Crow is a Navy brat, which means like his dad was in the Navy. He went to 16 schools before he graduated high school. He moved around a lot. Um, and so I, I think there's it, what you just said is really, really important to note that like there's no traditional path. And the idea of going to a brick and mortar institution is not in the cards for a lot of people. And so we like immediately like just all those people are cut out. And so how do we bring them back in? And I, I think it's super important what you're doing and what we're trying to do is to bring more people into higher education. It's it's really, really, really important. Oh yeah, the, you know, it, just to, for anybody who's interested, the facts and figures on what a de college degree or a four-year university degree gets you in life is extraordinary. Somebody said, um, it, it, it's basically, it's a an investment that returns, somebody said 15% uh, per year, um, for the rest of your life. And as somebody pointed out, if that was a Wall Street stock, it would be the darling of Wall Street because 15% every year is quite extraordinary. On, a, on average, they're saying that if you have a college degree, your average, your salary every year, your annual salary goes up by $24,000. And then not to mention the benefits in terms of our healthcare systems because um, education is also a determinant of health. So. Mm -hmm. The fact that we're not making an effort to include everybody, you just wonder, there's so many good benefits, even economic ones, that we, you have to wonder why we're not doing it. It, it, seems, uh, it seems really important. Um, uh, we've got a couple of comments. Uh, Salma wrote, it is amazing how your leadership forced this change, growth and inclusivity. And Hermie said something similar. Love that story of the Dean. Change is difficult, but often rewarding. Your teaching and curriculum model is inspirational. Um, and I'm, I'm just looking to see if we've got any other other questions. Um, I, I, I do sort of have one myself, Mark, if you don't mind. Sure. The, um, could you describe the mobile building space um, in more detail? Yeah, so it's um, it, it's it's crazy. So the Girl Scouts in Arizona, um, there's a, um, a, a the Arizona Pine Council is based in Maricopa County, so they're local. They have a um, a camp which is based in the city, but it's on uh, it's on South Mountain, which is south of here. So it's a somewhat uh, it's really beautiful actually. But the girls can go to camp there, and then they have a series of different camps that are much more rural uh, in Arizona that are in that that girls will go for a, a week or something or so during the summer and they do different programming. Uh, the programming usually leads to badges and the idea of having those badges on the campus, they usually relate to things that are that are on site. So the mobile building space is essentially a box truck and it's air conditioned. And in the back, there's essentially storage and some table spaces. And depending on the project, so one of the projects um, has to do with ecology and the girls will essentially map out a um, hundred yard, hundred yard uh, square and sort of document what's in there. Another project uh, has them working with different types of plumbing and another one has them working with different types of electricity. So getting a solar panel and then wiring um, a unit that can then be powered so that they can charge their phone. Um, so that stuff requires some equipment. So it requires like just some stuff, right? So what will happen is that this truck will go, rather than having all that stuff being brought to the site and left there, the truck will go up to the site and will unload all of the stuff that's in the back of it, the tools, the equipment, the electronics, et cetera. And then they'll have a, they have a camera or a, sorry, a television on the side of it. And there'll be a video on how, what the programming is going to be. And then the girls will will do the project and then they'll get the badge and then that can go to different places. So it's it's the ability of having um, these programs being in, in different spots. And there's one one of the um, conversations was that there's a, a camp on the reservation in the north and they never have good program like they don't have enough programming. And so this truck will be able to go there uh, and actually sort of develop some programming on the reservation. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Um, I'm just seeing if there's any uh, last questions or comments. I'm checking both the chat and the um, the Q and A, um, but I think I think that's that's 
that's it. I just wanted to, to say thank you, Mark, um, but also to remind everybody that on Friday, Neil Pinder is going to be speaking. And um, you know, it, it, that's at 10.30 Pacific Daylight Time, 11.30 Mountain Daylight Time, and 1.30 Eastern Daylight Time. So if you're not on Daylight Savings Time, you'll have to make an adjustment. I think it would be an hour earlier. So, um, so, but we'd, we'd hope to see everybody and there's lots of thank yous coming in, Mark. Um, so uh, this has been a great session and we really appreciate you making, oh, there's a, there's a, oh, there's clapping hands. Okay. <laughs> um, the, uh, this has been a great session and we would look forward to, I mean, there's so many great ideas here that uh, we would look forward if we can collaborate in any way, shape or form with Arizona State University we would be delighted to do so. And yeah, uh, I, I, I was going to mention that. I, I wonder if there's a way to think about some collaborative reviews or something. I mean, we like, I remember in COVID we had a, I had a review with like people from all around the world, you know, and it was like a bunch of people that like teach in Montreal or teach in Boston that I can't bring in because we can't fly them in. It's too much money, you know? And so even if there's a way to collaborate on some reviews, get our students talking to each other, I think it'd be wonderful. Oh, that'd be great. Um, we did a, a joint studio with Tech Monterey um, okay. in, the, in the fall, and they were looking up at the, um, you know, the Fort McMurray area and uh, doing some emergency shelters and things like that. So we would, um, uh, we'd be delighted. In fact, yeah. the Tech Monterey people shared with us some of their interesting techniques uh, for their global classroom, like icebreakers and other kinds yeah, of yeah. things, which we'd be delighted to uh, kind of share. And also, uh, feel free, I think you could probably ask any of us at the, the Center for Architecture uh, to be uh, guest critics at any of your studios, and we might very well reach out to you for the same. That would be great. And I, I just want to say, I, I really appreciate all you're doing um, at, at, at your school. It's really, really important work. It's really good stuff. And thank you very much for including me in the in the conversation. I'm very happy to be here, and uh, yeah, I really appreciate what you're doing. Well, thank you, I, and it is a tribute. Many of the people who are online right now um, have made significant contributions to that, and so I hope they heard that because uh, <laughs> it's much appreciated. All right. Okay. okay. Take care, everybody, and hopefully I'll Thanks, see everybody. you. Uh, everybody.